Again, welcome to our seventh uh, edition of Smarter From Home. I'm Matt Prohaska, CEO and Principal. Proud to be with you and thrilled to be uh, presenting the topic, especially with public and live ramp. Um, here's our agenda for today. Uh, we've got a very condensed meet and greet. We're going to get right to it because there's too much good material uh, to cover here, uh, not just from Paul Semino, our global head of data strategy with Prohaska Consulting, where he and I will tag team some of the foundation and history lessons uh, involved with how we got here and what we can do going forward. We're going to hear from PubMatic and LiveRamp. Again, thrilled to have both of these great companies helping underwrite and making uh, and keeping uh, this series free for everyone. And then we'll have a fireside chat with Tim Barnes, um, fellow uh, Fairfield uh, County uh, native here in Connecticut, where, uh, where I and we are based uh, on the home front. Um, he was most recently Chief Data Officer at AT&T with their Xander division. So it'll be great to get his perspective. And then as always, we're going to open it up to some q and I'm sure there will be just a couple of questions and comments. Uh, feel free, again, from a housekeeping standpoint, here's how we always will run it. Please use the raise hand icons or the chat. Uh, we'll be checking in both areas, whatever is easiest for you. Um, all of our audio will be, will be muted during the presentation, and then we'll unmute uh, if we can get some voices there throughout. Otherwise, we'll just be reading your questions as we go. And, spreading the love and getting answers ideally from all of our great, uh, our great presenters today. Uh, and then as always, uh, the recording in these presentations will be sent to everyone afterwards uh, for sharing and for those uh, who you may have colleagues or friends who can't make it live or didn't catch uh, the first five minutes of the last five minutes, you'll be able to experience everything in full on demand. Once again, uh, for those who aren't as familiar with Prask Consulting, uh, we've helped uh, now almost 400 clients proudly over six years around tech targets and talent. Um, certainly, uh, this topic of identity is one of the top three things that we're uh, focused on or actually helping clients with around the world now. So um, certainly uh, a, a critical topic. And uh, without further ado, let's jump into our uh, foundation here of how we got here and what to do. I'll cover the first uh, few uh, se uh, sections here and then toss to Paul Semino, our global head of data strategy. Um, who, again, has been uh, thrilled to have had him and privileged uh, with us for uh, more than five years now. Uh, Paul uh, created and built one of the first ever DMPs, Brillig, that sold to Merkel, uh, which is now part of Dentsu and that entire empire. So Paul does know a thing or two. We'll show a reference about how far back uh, he goes and, uh, and how his uh, interest and passion uh, and expertise has gone as well. Um, so uh, we know we've gotten here in the digital, so-called digital space, um, because of a little bit of necessity. Um, often, as we know, um, necessity is the mother of invention. So we've had three browser companies come out and either lay terms already on their own in, in Safari's case or set a timeline in Chrome's case. That was kind of the, the final straw, if you will. Most people had been certainly working on this uh, on their own uh, from either a tech or publisher or brand standpoint for years uh, beforehand, but certainly the, the uh, the gun is sounded, and uh, there's a little bit of a race now, and fortunately, a good sense of urgency uh, to be making some industry-wide changes uh, over the next uh, year plus. Um, here is the evidence of how far back we go, other than Mr. Samir looking uh, very, very dapper uh, with the specs now and the, uh, and the tighter look, uh, as he, you can tell how well he's aged, um, but how he predicted this uh, just over seven years ago now um, around Cookie's uh, status and how you know, certainly we are now here. Um, you know, not only uh, digital uh, cookies uh, in the world of laptops uh, and mobile web, but, you know, we, we expect that uh, maids or mobile advertising IDs will be next. Uh, we assume that this is going to be a very similar script playing out across all media channels. Um, we know there are, there are uh, so-called, uh, that some called browser gods uh, that are dictating terms already in television. We've had them for years. They're called MVPDs. Um, and so, you know, the terms that are dictated with the smart television sets in our living rooms and family rooms and basements and uh, what we take with us every single day on our phones and laptops, trying to find one solution uh, that can avoid, uh, frankly, these implications if nothing is done. This is just a series of things that uh, cannot be done going forward. Uh, if we lose this great ability that we've had uh, across the ecosystem uh, for more than 12 years now. For those that need some fundamentals, uh, we're talking about the difference between deterministic and probabilistic. Uh, probabilistic is what 99% of uh, publishers and brands work with today, where you see behavior exhibited on one device, you see it on another, 
you are using a, a third party cookie to uh, tie to a machine ID and probably predict that that is the same unique person. Deterministically is where Google, Facebook, and Amazon are, and Twitter, and LinkedIn, and everybody else, where it's been determined that you are Paul Semino or Matt Prohaska or Nikki Hawk. Um, it's because we've already signed in and told you that. As we know, there is a challenge with Walled Gardens where three companies are 60% of digital spend in every developed uh, country outside of mainland China today, and it's because they have two things in spades, deterministic identity and attribution and measurement. You're going to hear from everyone today around how these two key areas are so intertwined um, to be able to have uh, effective use of reach frequency, uh, creative sequencing, um, and to try and provide a lot of these initiatives are around presenting some alternatives to walled gardens. Um, because we could have a world where there are 5,000 walled gardens, um, which makes it very, very difficult for individual publishers and brands. Um, or in the case of our friend Vin Pelosi here at Kineso, part of IPG's agency empire, you know, a combination of, of needing to stitch together deterministic, probabilistic, and, and various forms of deterministic ID matching to be able to stitch together uh, better profiling so that we can leverage the consumer interest and behavior across various properties uh, with brands and with publishers. The whole idea here is to avoid a lot of publishers that we know that have attended here, that I know a lot of the tech firms on this, uh, on this webinar work with, and a lot of brands feel like they're, they're trying to fight with at least nine fingers tied behind their back. So without further ado, we'll toss to Paul Semino to get a little more foundation uh, building here around ID graphs and how that matters for measurement and what everyone should be working towards with building around a CDP. Paul? Thank you, Matt, uh, and good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. I'm in Austin, Texas, so it's still morning, uh, or I guess it's afternoon, uh, morning, still in New York as well. So um, just first, the perspective on the cookie prediction that I made in 2013, it, I was, I'm not a futurist. I, I can't see the future, but I had started my career as, as a CEO of an e-commerce company in the 90s, and I knew where cookies came from, which I think a lot of us in ad tech have forgotten, which is when we first built e-commerce websites, the load from a session standpoint on the servers was, was high because we wanted to retain the shopping cart, right? So after a while, the servers crashed, and that's when the WC3 and the sort of consortium said, let's have a cookie to write to the machine so we can remember that user when it comes back. Subsequent to that, the advertising industry wanted to count uh, impressions that gave birth to the third party cookie and then the rest is history. So I knew that, it, I mean, if you really think about it, it's a hack. The third party cookie is a little bit of a browser hack and a server hack. Um, and I think in forgetting about it, we, we sort of built our financial and, and our tracking systems on that somewhat faulty um, mechanism, which had a privacy issue. It has some technical issues, um, some transparency issues. So that's what I felt in 2013. And back then, um, uh, Brillig uh, had, we had already seen the degradation of cookies as mobile became uh, more prevalent and uh, cookie sting stinginess became sort of prevalent. So we started to produce very early graphs. I, I wouldn't even call it a graph. It was sort of an if then statement. If you didn't have a cookie, then look at something else. And that for something else was the IP address or some derivative of the IP address. Um, which we'll get into a little bit, but, but, but you know, whether, whether you want to think about it like probabilistic identity or programmatic identity, the graph or, or just being um, very, very aggressive about retaining all of these ID points is what, you know, whether you're on the buy side or the sell side in, or in tech is what you have to do. Um, right now, there is no system that connects all the graphs, but that's kind of what we think is going to happen and what I'll talk about in a little while. Um, and if you know, move to the next, and and because when you think about the number of elements that can be used for identity and targeting and attribution and measurement, it's pretty substantial. It's a soup of information, you know. And what you have is sort of on the right side is the way that digital functions with hashes of emails that turn into cookies or or other identifiers, mobile identifiers, um, whether they're deterministic or probabilistic, it doesn't really matter. On the left is sort of the way commerce or marketing happens with email, name, address, loyalty system, customer ID. And in the middle is, I think, an area that Prohaska studies a lot, which is geo, the addressability of anything from a ge geography standpoint. 
whether that's um, outdoor media, radio, television has always been geo-based. So there you have, you know, the DMA, the old DMA, you have census blocks, um, uh, you have um, hy hyper geo like zip four and zip five, you have lat long and, and sort of, you know, radius around a lat long or, or some kind of a polygon uh, uh, based on the combination of lat long and zip codes. Um, and and I, I, you could tell I came out of retail and direct marketing because that's the way direct mail has functioned for 35 years. Um, so you, you have to consider all of these things when you, when you think about building a graph because the, um, the programmatic nature of identity that's happening uh, and the reason that, you know, sort of the truth set that companies like Pubmatic and LiveRamp are providing us, they're sort of like the, 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 the interstate system for all this stuff. I mean, you can drive anything, you know, like a car, a truck or anything on the interstate um, and that's our traffic um, because you need to have all of these inside of your enterprise because when you, if you turn this, uh, just this pyramid is just based on, you know, anything is addressable when you think about it digitally because something, it has at least a lat long, if not some kind of zip code or hyper geo attachment up from that is household, which is mostly IP address or a combination of IP address and, and um, uh, zip. Cookie is the, the pseudonymous sort of moniker for us inside of uh, advertising. Then you get into more CRM oriented stuff like email and mobile and the identifiers that come off that that's more closer to one to one. And then the only folks that have sort of the wall, the, the absolute identity of us is the wall garden. Um, so when you turn this pyramid on its on the other side, you get sort of the way the marketing funnel looks, which is at the top, we don't necessarily need one to one, right? It's, it's actually not cost effective to one to one market um, to uh, people that are considering your product in three years or like an auto, an automotive pitch. But if you're thinking about like the master use case that, that Prohaska thinks this is about is sort of, it's, um, it's looking at um, frequency capping and suppression simultaneously. So if you wanted to divide up the entire world of your prospects and your audience into like quartiles, four, four steps, and you wanted to really start to suppress or turn down the lowest, most, you know, the least relevant quartile, how would you do it? Um, you'd need something like this because at the top, you don't need deterministic. You, you want broad because you're looking for reach. You want the broader types of idea. But, but as you get towards the middle, this is where the break happens between advertising and marketing. There isn't a way right now for us to go from um, uh, branding and, and recall into intent and purchase consideration. So um, a little bit maybe more detailed, but um, so what the community is trying to do, the, the technology community and the, and the brands and the publishers is come up with the next big thing. And, and there, there's, there's tremendous consortium efforts out there from, um, you know, uh, the live ramp, there, there's the, the um, IAB and the other trade organizations trying to come together. And, and it, there's some very important lessons in the past. There's like, when I was in at Saks as a buyer in retail, we had um, EDI was all the rage. And it took 10 years for the different back end and, and um, middleware companies to agree on protocols to exchange port purchase orders, invoices, and money uh, seamlessly. Some people lost, some people won. It's like the, the, the Betamax, uh, VHS kind of thing. Um, and, and so there's that, there's, there's the financial information exchange protocols and the markets that gave birth to machine uh, trading and high frequency trading. Um, and, and I think that this is the, the road that we're on, which is the, the, the new monikers and the new identity consortiums that are forming are gonna, are gonna set the stage for a, a revolution of sort of, um, you know, more relevant advertising um, and uh, better experiences for consumers without having any, any kind of privacy issues. So our perspective, Prohaska's perspective um, is that brands, you know, the principles, whether, whether they're represented by a vendor or, when, or they're doing it on their own, um, must have a first party or enterprise graph system that covers those, you know, both the probabilistic top of funnel stuff and, and the lower, the mid and lower funnel deterministic one-to-one -one stuff. Um, it's, uh, it's up to LiveRamp and some of the interconnectors and, and 
uh, pubmatic and to figure out how these things link together. I think that has yet to be determined uh, in, the, in the press for, for Matt and I, or, you know, I've called it the son of blockchain. I don't know if it's going to be crypto. I don't know if it's going to be a, a ledger, but the, there's something else coming after this sort of um, the, the sort of uh, the tourniquet that we've kind of put on the industry relative to the threat from the browsers and from uh, some of the, you know, the ad blockers, which we haven't talked about. And, and there's a lot of things closing in, the regulators also. So uh, because the, the having your own lexicon, your own nomenclature that relates your segmentation, your measurement, your systems, whether you're a retailer, a brand, a publisher, is going to be paramount. Um, because if you have four or five different things that you're playing in, they'll all have different sort of lexicons and it'll be hard to relate back to that business case of, of uh, you know, 360 degree frequency capping and suppression. Um, so, because the, you know, it's just another <laughs> three letter acronym, but CDP we at Prohaska think is, it's sort of the enterprise marketing system. It's not, you know, CDP might evolve into this, but it's really that, ultra connection point and, and the holder of your secret formula of how you find uh, interest, convert and make loyal your new customers. And as we change with all the different media points with connected TV and users um, preferences and, and viewing habits are changing due to the, the pandemic. I mean, it's, it's even accelerating faster to get this sort of, you know, uh, this brain type application inside your company and to own it lock, stock and barrel. So, so just to recap, um, we think geo is important because it, there are so many other sort of geo, the data sets and keys to those data sets that we don't think about right now. Um, so, you know, look around, there's some, there, there are good vendors that work in and between the, 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 the cookie world and the, you know, what we're talking about here and, and these other worlds of, of outdoor and of uh, direct mail and things that are based on zip codes, IPs and whatnot. Um, and you can see uh, also the emergence of the, the CMPs, which um, I had worked on a couple of early ones, and then these products have really matured and they're becoming imp important. We talk to them, we talk about them with our clients as agile paywalls on the publishing side, meaning that this, this gives you an agile opportunity to sort of introduce little, little loyalty systems into your business mix. It doesn't have to be, hey, if you, want to, if you want to see our stuff, then you're going to have to uh, click this button and give us your email address, uh, or you're going to pay. You know, that, that's sort of the most brutal paywall. There are, there's, they're, they're wonderfully creative at letting you put in light paywall, medium, move it around, and that's, that's what most people on the sell side are doing. So a lot of good movement there. And uh, I'll pass back to Matt now. You're on mute. Matt, you're on and his uh, can you guys hear me okay yeah thanks okay strange sorry about that um, yeah you can hear uh, Paul's uh, info is at the end uh, to hear uh, from him or me about the 60 or so engagements Paul's been a part of helping publishers uh, brands agencies and tech in that area uh, this is one initiative we want to give a shout out uh, we were privileged to be hired by the IB Tech Lab to help them launch Project ReArc. Um, Jordan Mitchell and Dennis Buckheim and, and uh, Benjamin Dick, uh, Joe uh, Pillow, the whole crew have been great um, at carrying forward uh, the momentum uh, from uh, the announcement in February uh, when this was first launched. And there is now a whole schedule and a task force that we're proud to be a part of with more than 300 different people uh, with a business working group, a technical and a legal and a policy. Um, this is uh, one of the proposed frameworks uh, that was announced then, uh, leveraging email. But as we all know, when it comes to uh, working cross media, when it comes to working uh, long tail, mid tail, and short tail, uh, when it comes to just frankly the relationship that publishers and marketers have with their audience, email address may not always be the default uh, and uh, standard way that everyone's going to work. This is one example, certainly not the only, but a way for everyone in the middle to work in a hashed and encrypted way so that everything is, everything is secure in between the, the key touch points that matter most with the publisher and with the brand. 
Um, real quick before we get to uh, Andrew and our friends at Pubmatic, uh, we have an we're announcing and we've been talking with about 50 companies so far around a global identity coalition uh, to create more momentum and the commercial momentum behind all the great work that the Ivy Tech Lab now is doing going forward, developing a standard over the next year. Uh, so we're working with publishers, brands, and agencies to create uh, liquidity, uh, really, and spending uh, with inventory so that publishers know that there are great brands available ready to spend in this fashion and that brands know that there are publishers in display and television and every media channel possible that when these standards get produced, uh, there will be enough inventory and audience to make it work work uh, worth everybody's while and make it work um, so more to come on that feel free to reach out to us for more information these are the companies that we uh, either have already talked to or uh, will be talking to in the next couple of weeks but you can see we're trying to get a global uh, coalition here and one that works with a lot of companies across all media channels um, so quick takeaways again um, cdp and cnp two uh, two acronyms that are pretty important together uh, around customer data platform and consent management uh, platform, making sure that your identity strategy ties in with your A&M attribution and measurement strategy is key. We encourage everyone to join the task force uh, with our friends at the IB Tech Lab. Great uh, momentum still happening there and carrying forward the announcement and working through a great three-phase uh, plan there. And then our own project momentum in the Global Identity Coalition uh, is available for those that are looking to sign up uh, and get started a little bit earlier and make sure that there is enough liquidity in the marketplace. Uh, with that, I want to quickly move over to uh, and, and welcome in Andrew Barron from Pubmatic. Uh, he's the VP, uh, one of their top machine learning uh, folks in the company globally, and he's also VP of Marketplace. And Andrew is going to take it from here talking about how they're working to help solve the identity crisis. Andrew? Thanks for the, uh, for the intro, Matt. I'm going to uh, flip over and uh, share my screen. Uh, hopefully you guys can uh, can see here. Okay, great. Uh, so yeah, so what I want to talk about today is uh, to dovetail off a few things that uh, that uh, uh, Matt Paul did a great job of of teeing up. Um, you know what I want to what I want to introduce is the difference between uh, identity and audience. Uh, how one is a building block to the other, identity being, uh, and the other one is uh, how. Uh, the SSP fits into to this space. So, uh, uh, and then particularly setting up uh, our friends at, uh, at Liveram, Jason White, who will come uh, right after, uh, how we work with identity partners to, uh, to help publishers uh, improve monetization and, and advertisers uh, get more return on their spend. Uh, so, uh, so as, as Matt mentioned, uh, I lead the marketplace team uh, marketplace team is uh, is focused on all things liquidity, so uh, that kind of breaks down into to three parts. So you got like business facing uh, data science, you got uh, machine learning engineer and uh, engineering, and uh, increasingly so uh, identity. Uh, and so the rest of this uh, this deck uh, is going to focus on that third part uh, around identity, given topic for today's discussion. So a bit more on uh, how the SSP fits into uh, to the identity space. Like forever, our mission has been about uh, delivering superior results, uh, yield-based results to uh, to publishers. And one of the important elements of that is uh, is letting advertisers uh, achieve their goals. Uh, and the thrust of this business has a lot been about uh, uh, audience buying. Uh, and then that's obviously been enabled by, by cookies. And the SSP's role here has been one of a translation link. So we help publishers connect to uh, some open standards like uh, third-party cookies uh, on the web. Uh, and that's allowed publishers to describe their inventory for advertisers who can then build segments and, uh, and achieve their campaign goals. So uh, one of the areas that uh, we're putting at the, the center of our strategy going forward is this notion of, of audience addressability. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, and as Paul did a good job of framing, uh, audience addressability is about uh, helping advertisers buy against their desired segments. And the building block to that is the unique identifier uh, that sits below those, those segments. And this has obviously come under attack. Uh, 
uh, particularly on the web uh, with the third party cookie. Um, but also, as, uh, as the ProAsca team mentioned, uh, we expect similar uh, issues uh, or announcements coming on the mobile front because there's not much difference. Um, and then to kind of put a finer point around how audience buying has been such the thrust of uh, programmatic revenue as we know today, if you were just to look at uh, traffic from a given publisher uh, without any ID, so think of it today as like cookie list traffic on the web, uh, you get a fairly low monetization rate. So this is what's happening on Firefox and Safari. Uh, a lot of impressions flow through servers and very little dollars uh, transact on top of those. But when you place a cookie on top of that, you get about a 15x to 20x uh, return on top of that. Uh, so this is where all of our businesses reside today, uh, web-based businesses, that is. And what I'm particularly excited for is that uh, this, these announcements uh, across Firefox, Chrome, uh, Firefox, Safari, and, uh, and now Chrome uh, is giving us a good uh, push to, as an industry to move forward towards uh, looking into these de-anonymized IDs, top of that pyramid that, that Paul mentioned before. And I think this is going to unlock some potential because what we're seeing is that as we move closer to the top of the pyramid, uh, you get a better understanding of the user, helps with a lot of those performance marketing uh, objectives as, as we mentioned. And what we're seeing is those actually uh, uh, drive increased monetization. You can think about better attribution models, better targeting, so on and so forth. So uh, I think the idea here is, yes, there is risk given announcements, um, but then there's also a net new opportunity of greenfield space, so which we can talk a bit more about. Uh, so again, going back to uh, uh, why now is the time to, to act. So we have this large uh, amorphous opportunity sitting in front of us. Let's call it a two year time horizon where 63% uh, of web traffic will no longer have cookie. Uh, and then given some of those differentials and monetization rates before, I'd venture a guess that most of the publishers here on this call have uh, more like 80, 90% of their, uh, their revenue stream coming from that, uh, that Chrome circle, uh, uh, where, uh, where that, that is where they're getting best monetization uh, and outside share of, of their audience. Uh, so there's the big bogey. Uh, but historically, uh, both in terms of Safari and Firefox, this is largely gone under monetized. Uh, and there's addressable opportunity there today. Uh, so finding alternatives to the cookie uh, within Safari and Firefox uh, has been a big boon for, uh, for a few tech providers in our industry today uh, and helping publishers to, uh, to start experiment, experimenting in this, uh, in this sandbox, I think, uh, can prove for great returns. And then lastly, uh, you should be thinking about future proofing your business. So, you know, with these announcements, uh, you draw a straight line and expect similar uh, things to happen uh, in mobile. Uh, that means uh, we need to have a strategy that, uh, that runs across consumption channels. So again, now going back to uh, what's Pubmatic as an SSP's role uh, in the identity space, uh, I think the key point I, I want to land here is that we see ourselves as a translation layer and as a management tool. Uh, for publishers uh, to create an identity strategy uh, and as a distribution channel for folks like uh, LiveRAM, let's call them identity providers uh, for, for conversation sake, uh, to, to access those publishers uh, and uh, as, uh, uh, as a, trans as a uh, recipient, uh, you've got uh, the world of buyers or the world of demand uh, that will be receiving their preferred IDs uh, from us. So Identity Hub is uh, the solution that, that we're talking about here. And so this, this solution was kind of designed around uh, four principles. So the first is in order for publishers to be working with this uh, growing world of, uh, of privately funded uh, enterprising companies like, uh, like LiveRamp, the identity providers, uh, they are gonna require some dev effort. So we wanna minimize uh, that, that, uh, that effort for each publisher. Uh, to work with every new uh, and every uh, capable uh, identity provider that comes to market. Uh, secondly, is about uh, minimizing management overhead. So uh, we want to be able to enable, disable identity providers, manage your ongoing roster, uh, and uh, and understand the yield that each is uh, that each is driving. 
Uh, so ultimately that should help with our third objective, which is to improve your decision making. So having a robust analytics, analytics framework that uh, helps you understand run A-B tests, uh, holding withholding groups uh, is, is the trick, is the key to, uh, to making these informed decisions. Uh, and so interoperability uh, is another key component uh, and future proofing. Uh, and so what we've done is we've designed this around, uh, around pre-bid, uh, so pre-bid user ID module. Uh, and so this will help with some of our upstream and downstream uh, uh, operability, which we can talk about a bit later. Uh, so, so on the pre-bid front, uh, obviously uh, this open source uh, solution uh, lends itself greatly to, uh, to notions of transparency. So uh, publishers can be uh, assured uh, how ID identity partners are being called. Uh, and ultimately that helps uh, users get comfort with uh, how their identity is being shared. Uh, and uh, it helps uh, create a scalable framework again uh, to minimize those dev costs uh, we talked about uh, earlier. Uh, it also leverages uh, the, uh, the community of developers that have uh, rallied around Prebit uh, and piggybacks off of the, the traction and market that, that it's realizing today. So again, uh, helps with the future proofing. Uh, so secondly, uh, the management UI is going to be the key like ease of use uh, concept here in uh, Identity Hub. So through this UI, you will be able to easily select uh, these identity providers talked about before, uh, enable, disable, set up experiments. Uh, and this is how uh, you will ultimately build that, uh, that identity strategy. Uh, so again, uh, you will be able to minimize uh, contract work. Uh, which we're, uh, we're always hearing is a big burden for, for publishers. So, uh, yeah, so that's in terms of management, negotiations, et cetera. Uh, and then obviously with uh, sharing insights, et cetera. So on the reporting and analytics front, uh, this is kind of where the, the rubber meets the road. So here is where you can start breaking down this large problem of, uh, of de-risking your Chrome business uh, of growing your Safari Firefox business today uh, by understanding the yield improvement that uh, different uh, identity providers are giving you through their preferred or through the demand channels that prefer them. Uh, and so this is, uh, this is gonna be, this is the simple UI that, uh, that'll unlock that, uh, that future-proof decision-making. And what makes it all work is essentially the identity providers. So having the largest uh, rostered and market uh, identity providers is essentially what gives you outsized returns uh, when you start creating this identity strategy. Uh, and so what we're seeing is that uh, many different buyers are expressing their own preferences across a variety of, of these identity providers. We expect new identity providers to emerge. Uh, we expect various market share amongst the identity providers to shift over time. Uh, so this requires quite a bit of, uh, of adaptability uh, from the publisher, and this solution is ultimately help meant to, uh, to help minimize those, those frictions. Uh, and then lastly, uh, communicating these identity providers both upstream. Think of, think of what happened in the world uh, transitioning from tag to header bidding. Uh, what uh, SSPs then had to do is communicate signals both to other SSPs uh, into wrappers uh, and down to uh, DSPs. Uh, so this is again uh, on the notion of, uh, of interoperability. We have uh, have designed what we think is the, the most interoperable uh, solution uh, available in market today to help with manage your, your growingly complex ad tech stacks. So what are some of the results that we've seen so far uh, in, our, in our implementations? So we've got publishers uh, across the grow in the US, in EMEA, uh, and in, in APAC. And what we do is uh, we dig in with these publishers to look at these identity provider DSP uh, variants. Uh, we specifically focus on uh, you know, the browsers they care about most. So let's call it Safari Firefox, where, uh, where match rate is, is notoriously low. Uh, and we've seen some pretty astounding, uh, some astounding results. So we were able to compare both the traffic that does not have an ID present to the traffic that has an ID present. Uh, and again, you can harken back to, uh, to those outsized, uh, 
uh, monetization rate charts, uh, bar charts from before to, to understand some of these, these results. So as these identity providers uh, increase their coverage, uh, find some probabilistic ways to stitch together uh, more IDs, uh, increase the footprint of their first party data, all things that, uh, that Paul and Matt uh, discussed earlier, uh, we expect these, uh, these numbers to grow and grow across more demand sources uh, as they express more preferences uh, into, uh, into their preferred identity provider solutions. So uh, what this should help give you comfort around is that this isn't just about preparing for uh, a two-year horizon. Uh, there's dollars to be had today, uh, and it's an exciting time to start uh, formulating a strategy. Uh, so then, so then lastly, uh, the benefit is we're heavily involved in these uh, uh, industry groups, uh, collaborating with leaders uh, 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 like people on this call. Uh, in order to, uh, to future-proof this solution uh, and formulate new standards, uh, which is one of those uh, tactics that, that helps all boats rise. So now's the time for collaboration. Now's the time for uh, cheap uh, experimentation. Uh, and I think uh, we've got some exciting times ahead. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Andrew. As you may have seen, andrew.baron, first dot last at pubmatic.com for more info or uh, check out uh, or get in touch with your uh, already established wonderful Pubmatic uh, sales lead. Um, so without further ado, I uh, want to, with that great uh, background on Identity Hub and all things uh, Pubmatic integrating with multiple solutions, wanted to uh, bring in uh, Jason White. Um, really thrilled to have uh, Jason personally uh, uh, on this, um, uh, some of you may know Jason for his, from his fantastic run leading the programmatic practice at CBS for many years. Uh, others may know of him uh, from his great individual work passionately with CBS and, and in addition on his own, uh, leading a lot of initiatives and charge and momentum on his own around uh, building a global identity coalition um, that he rallied and just at the same time uh, as uh, things were getting started with the Ivy Tech Lab. Uh, full disclosure, you will see his uh, byline um, as part of our team. He was a key member of our crew uh, that was a part of the initiative getting REARC off the ground. Um, and so we're thrilled that he has moved on to a fantastic new opportunity here with our friends at LiveRamp leading global publisher initiatives. Um, so I'm going to, uh, as a thank you for his work from us, I'm actually going to drive his slides for him. So uh, without further ado, take it away, Mr. Jason Wood. Thanks, Matt. Can you hear me okay? I appreciate the intro and Andrew, <clears throat> great job. Uh, we, uh, you're a great partner of ours and we look forward to continuing to uh, power Identity Hub um, and growing that partnership. Uh, first, before I get started, I just wanted to you know, acknowledge, um, it's trite but true, um, the challenging times that we're all facing um, and just know that we're all in this together. So uh, everybody stay safe and stay healthy. Um, so we'll jump in. Uh, today, we're gonna talk about overcoming the advertising uh, industry's trust deficit. We're gonna myth bust on some addressability and authentication issues that we see out there. Agenda is core of how we got here. Uh, we talk about how we're building a trusted ecosystem together, uh, the entire industry. Uh, we talk about the opportunities for marketers, publishers, just some highlights there, and then we'll get into some myth busting. Next slide, please. Um, so how we got here, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, everybody's seen some of the bad behaviors out there in terms of the ad industry. Um, but anecdotally, you know, we can just talk about retargeting. Um, you know, people are being targeted with things that aren't relevant to them uh, because they're not the individual user. Um, the usual example that I give is I constantly get retargeted with my wife's uh, Nordstrom shoe ads. Um, that's obviously a miss. Um, so there's been broken trust there, um, and that's led to privacy regulations. We've had GDPR, CCPA, um, we're all aware of that, which ultimately is leading uh, to the end of the cookie, the crumbling, uh, if we go to the next slide. Uh, this foundation is in fact crumbling. Um, in addition to the browser changes, we've recognized that while cookies are the backbone of the current ecosystem, they're fraught with issues. So number one, the lack of transparency um, you know, it gives consumers no control of their data. Uh, number two, they're not people-based. Uh, they represent a device. Um, number three, they aren't interoperable at all. 
um, and that they require cookie syncs to share data uh, between platforms resulting in significant data loss. Uh, and they're subject to number four, a deletion of leading to inaccurate measurement. Measurement's a huge problem. Um, and last, the newer channels, and we'll discuss this earlier, CTV app, they don't even use them. Um, so we've been working to rally the industry um, around solving these challenges for years. Next slide, please. Um, and so <clears throat> this brings us to the value exchange conversation that we're having. Um, look, the internet is ad supported. Uh, and the thing that's um, gotten me excited over the years, 20 plus years that I've been in this industry is um, we're making the internet free. We're democratizing information. And, and that's a noble, uh, a noble job and a noble creed. Um, and making uh, businesses sustainable. So we have a vision of the future that goes beyond identifiers. Um, authenticated ecosystem where the user can decide. The user decides where they want to stay and what they, how they want to maintain a relationship with the individual publishers that they have a relationship with. There's something new being built. We call it a trusted ecosystem. It's authenticated um, uh, consumer management with trusted first parties. Those are brands and publishers. Uh, it's not a replacement for third parties. It's new and it's better. It's better for people, publishers, and marketers. For people, it's transparent. They finally have control over dynamic preferences. For publishers, uh, it creates trusted first party relationships, high quality experience, superior monetization, as Andrew kind of hit on uh, before, and we'll, we'll highlight some of that as well. Um, and enhanced data assets, they're finally in control of the data. Uh, and not being kind of like canvases like uh, we were for the seven years that I was at CBS. It, it sometimes felt that way when we didn't have insight into the audiences and, and what was being bought uh, by whom and for whom. Uh, and for brands, it powers uh, consumer journeys, access to trusted environments and a better understanding of their effectiveness cross-platform. Uh, next slide, please. So high level, the opportunity for publishers. Um, we redefine the value exchange with consumers through the first party authentication events. Um, it leverages the authentication um, to identify visitors and enable addressability sans third party cookies um, and actively manage reader consent and preferences uh, for an improved user experience. Next slide, please. The opportunity for marketers is pretty significant. Uh, we look at it as a use case uh, and several use cases. And, and from my experience in the upfronts, the chief investment officers are constantly looking for uh, a few things. Uh, number one, they're looking for global frequency capping. Uh, number two, they wanna apply that cross platform. So it's not just the web that we're talking about here, it's app, it's CTV, it's everywhere. Um, number three, they wanna do that so they can manage against duplication. They wanna get true incrementality and incremental reach um, for the most effective desired outcomes, which in most cases is sales. That's what they're on the hook for. And to be able to measure that cross-platform, that's the real opportunity here that we're building. Next slide, please. So over the past few years, uh, we've been a leader in rallying all of our partners across the industry to make it more people-based, right? And solve for the faults that are inherent in the, uh, the existing cookie infrastructure. So in 2017, uh, we uh, co-founded the Advertising ID Consortium uh, to add identity link into the bid stream uh, and enable platforms to transact on a true people-based identifier. Um, today, it's in 45% uh, across 45% of all the impressions that we see, 16 billion impressions a day have an identity link. Since there, we've launched a number of other initiatives, including our most recent launch. And this Authenticated traffic solution enables um, addressability, full addressability on a publisher's site. Next slide, please. So how are we doing this? We're providing addressability on identity link across the programmatic ecosystem by essentially embedding our graph within key pieces of the supply chain to enable marketers to continue to target one-to-one, -one, just like we talked about answering those use cases without relying on third-party cookies, of course. So number one, identifying consumer at the inventory source. Uh, LiveRamp is able to identify consumers wherever they are. Uh, this is across in-app, connected TV, cookie-less browsers, um, could be a smart refrigerator, um, as uh, Travis Klinger has, uh, has intimated before, anything that's got a screen or an ad. Um, this includes ATS for cookies, uh, browsers, which today are Safari, Firefox, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. 
transacting on IDL. We've enabled DSPs, the entire uh, uh, programmatic DSP ecosystem, to leverage our graph for free and, and perpetuity to decision and transact on those IDLs. DSPs receive the audience data via IDL, uh, eliminating audience loss. Uh, they historically saw with cookies, uh, and that's the uh, that's the other thing. Uh, the syncing has been terrible, and ultimately, on a publisher site, you only see about a forty percent cookie match, if that. Uh, and lastly, measuring on IDL, we want to ensure um, that advertisers aren't only able to activate their data, but measure every impression purchased to understand the effectiveness of their investments. Uh, and DSPs are producing exposure logs that can help that. Next slide, please. So how does this work? Uh, when a user authenticates, and there's gonna be a test on this afterwards, so I want everybody to lean in here. Uh, <laughs> uh, when a user authenticates, the LiveRamp JavaScript, or the API, hashes PII, uh, and it looks up the IDL. The IDL is returned in an encrypted envelope, and the pub stores it in their first party cookie. So to pause here, no PII is ever stored by LiveRamp. Uh, it is looked up. Uh, in our Abilitech database where we have 250 million records. Um, and there is that match. And then we provide the envelope stored in the first party cookie. Number two, the SSP grabs the IDL envelope from the first party cookie, decrypts it, and then translates it in real time to the specific encoding for each DSP, since we encode IDL specific for each platform. This enabled added security right, with increased privacy. So every SSP has their own IDL uh, uh, tied to their own namespace. Um, so you note here that Safaris have uh, seven day expirations um, on first party cookies and, uh, and Chrome has 30 days. Um, so the user has to uh, authenticate um, each time. Um, but net net, uh, the, uh, the indesired outcome is, is that each advertiser through their ad server integrated on their DSP um, is able to have full addressability end to end. Next slide, please. So this is a good, great case study that we did with our, uh, our good friends at the Goodway Group. Um, uh, we worked with a, a very large national retailer client um, and they were looking for ways to increase scale of first party data um, and reduce the audience loss um, they experienced due to the cookies. Um, so the solution, we partnered up with the Index Exchange um, and <clears throat> provide a good way group a solution that mag matches contextually rich inventory with their client clients qualified leads and we delivered greater reach against that so the results we saw three times higher unique reach um, we saw 10 times higher win rates um, and we saw about 185 percent increase of reach on desktop next slide please so let's bust some myths that we've heard out there. Um, uh, we have seen and heard uh, a lot of, of folks say, particularly on the publisher side, hey, I've got a small percentage of authenticated traffic and it isn't meaningful from a revenue perspective. And usually for some of the larger publishers, we've seen about 10% um, authentication or their inventory being addressable. Uh, but some of these smaller publishers, let's say that they're in the four or 5% range. So at the end of the day, going back on the numbers that we looked at, um, if the CPMs are 55% less on cookie-less inventory, uh, and you have an opportunity to, and what we've seen in some of our case studies is the CPMs are 20% higher than a Chrome cookie CPM, wouldn't you wanna change trade rather that CPM uh, for one that's 55% less? Um, and when you look at the numbers, and we've got a revenue calculator that we personally work with every single publisher on, when you look at the numbers, it's significant. Not only does it stave off um, the revenue decline, um, in all cases, there's a huge revenue upside. And we have advertisers across the board, the top 400 advertisers in the industry are working with us on IDL. Um, and they're leaning in in a big way this quarter and purchasing on IDL. Next slide, please. So myth number two, uh, availability identity solutions aren't secure. Well, we just walked through a workflow, again, we'll have a quiz on a little later, um, that shows that um, it is absolutely secure. Um, if you find the right solution, make sure that there is no hashed email that's being passed in the bid stream, um, that there's no PII that's being passed in the bid stream, and that nobody is storing that PII. It's critically important uh, when you evaluate any um, identity partner. 
that you look for those things. And the next one, next slide, myth number three, um, there are other solutions that solve for uh, advertisers' core use cases. So, you know, when you, when you see about some of these things in the sandbox that are being talked about, some of the browser solutions that are being talked about, it's important to go back to that marketer slide that we talked about when we talked about the advertisers' core use cases, and we'll kind of end on it. Um, remember, they want global frequency capping. They want to target cross-platform. So it's not just the web that we're talking about here. It's app, it's CTV. Uh, they want to manage against duplication and get true incremental reach, and they want to measure cross-platform. So any individual browser solution is just a solution for that individual browser. It's not a solution for the entire ecosystem. And next slide. That concludes it for today. Folks, thanks so much for taking the time. And uh, again, stay safe, stay healthy. Great stuff. Thank you, Jason. Um, always great to hear from uh, one of the OGs, original gangsters uh, in the space and live ramp, and one of the individual OGs uh, from Jason personally. West side. Uh, so, West side, Matt. West yeah. side. Nice. Uh, representing that uh, very, very street, tough neighborhood of Palm Springs, California, uh, where Jason's based. I know a, a, a different kind of hood out there. <laughs> very nice. Uh, like the gesture, very, uh, very authentic. Um, so look, we want to bring in um, a little bit of the east side now, uh, at least in the U.S. Uh, here. Uh, Tim Barnes, uh, Fairfield County uh, fellow um, uh, native and resident here. Um, first of all, before we get to Tim, just wanted to read off from the poll. 45% of folks have an identity strategy. 29%, thank you, Renee, uh, do not. And 26%, I don't know. That's not bad. Uh, we would have thought it would have been skewed a little more towards the bottom two. Um, so uh, thank you for sharing all those and great uh, responses in full from this uh, from this well attended uh, packed virtual house here. So Tim, uh, wanted to uh, get your perspective here um, for uh, folks that need to uh, check out his his LinkedIn profile <clears throat> and uh, and CV overall. Um, Tim uh, spent the last two years at AT and T as part of Xander's initiative, running all of uh, data there. Uh, and before that, though, lengthy and uh, impressive uh, uh, roles running products at top uh, tech firms over the last 10 years was at Razorfish way back in the day. And so, Tim, wanted to uh, first get your take on what you've already heard today, if there were things that you would add or dispute, uh, given uh, your great perspective, being inside a, a, a very large uh, O&O uh, and major publisher with their own tech, uh, and just throughout your entire career and history there, seeing this evolution. Well, I hope you can hear me, Matt. Um, thank you for having yep. me. I, I love that you put that picture up. Uh, those were the glory days when I didn't have to cut my own hair. Um, I like to tell my wife I'm two and one in that effort so far. So, you know, hopefully I'll, I'll get to three and one here in a week or so. But, uh, okay, right. so to answer your question, you know, look, I, I, I really enjoyed the, the presentation from both uh, Jason and Andrew. Uh, with respect to their various technologies, both big partners of Xander and at and and, you know, continue to be, be so. Uh, look, I, I think one of the things that often goes under said, it was, it was highlighted, um, it, but the, a lot of the discussion was around publishers, and we really need to focus heavily on both the trust of the consumer um, and, you know, the people who actually bring the check to this, this whole party, which, of course, is the marketer or the brand advertiser. And I think that's one of the things that's really interesting at at and while we did own an enormous amount of television inventory, certainly our own O and O digital inventory through the Warner Media acquisition, and our own technology, um, it still was uh, you know from an identity perspective the the three plus consumer interactions that we saw on a monthly basis, many of which were deterministic, was still insufficient to be quite frank to reach massive scale for brand advertisers. Great from a direct response perspective, and Direct TV is an example of that where you have. Um, you know, a one-to-one -one relationship between the consumer, uh, that is the subscriber, and the advertiser. And in that case, you know, direct response advertising works very well because I have a direct match and it's all deterministic. But when I expand that out into other O&O &O across CNN or, or uh, the TNT properties, et cetera, I start to run into um, problems with scale, especially when I want to apply the at and deterministic graph against that scale. And that's where a lot of the discussion points that uh, Jason highlighted with LiveRamp become imperative, frankly. It's, it's how do we think about expanding on a large scale of first-party data to make it sufficient 
for a broad advertiser like a Procter & Gamble or, or somebody else who's in the, in the broad reach space. Uh, from a consumer perspective, Matt, I, I, we all are uh, probably a little bit shell-shocked and get from CCPA and future legislation. I think it's kind of the coronavirus may have taken some of the emphasis on that, but it continues to happen behind the scenes. And, you know, at the end, um, we all need to think about how we build a system that doesn't just get consumer permission. Let's be honest, the way that most of us achieve consumer permission is, you know, through long 37 page terms and conditions that we all agree to because it's in the way we just want to get on with our business. We need to find a way that the consumers are engaged, understand how their data is being used and actually really see the value exchange that comes with that. And I was happy to hear from both Pubmatic and LiveRamp and the efforts they're taking to um, you know, sort of ensure content as it's presented creates a value exchange. Great perspective. Thank you. Um, wanted to focus a little bit more uh, to your point on on the buy side and brands. Do you um, w was your experience at 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 and T and Xander with the the top brands that were I guess more early adopters, uh, as you said, that were looking to create that additional scale? Did you find that uh, the majority of U.S. or global brands were able to kind of bring their own other forms of of graphing to append appropriately? Um, and be able to have one plus one equal 11? Or uh, would, you, would you characterize, tough to say, obviously, with a, a big learning curve and adoption curve with brands right now in early 2020, um, since we're still in, in early innings, uh, for sure, around uh, developing uh, post-cookie solutions that are adopted globally here um, by, again, either uh, by choice and or by necessity. Um, where did you find some of the successes of what uh, brands with their agency partners were we're doing to to help uh, deliver that scale beyond AT and T's amazing scale already. Right. Yeah. I mean, great question. We we uh, especially in the addressable TV space, but certainly as we think about cross channel and cross distribution, uh, we had a great advantage in that deterministic graph. And so when we thought about a roof company, for example, who wanted to target people who were coming off lease using pulp data or some other internal data they may have, we enjoyed a very and enjoy I should very. Uh, to tie uh, prospective customers determinants to graph and actually action against that through an addressable television platform and also be able to then extrapolate that down to our digital platforms as well. Um, the challenge, of course, becomes to think about micro-targeting. You start, this, you know, DirecTV represents roughly 20% of the U.S. households. Uh, you know, it has its own challenges, as most MVPDs do. Um, but at the end of the day, um, you, you know, if you want to get broad reach from that and you want to buy on a broadcast type network, you're not going to see sufficient reach. So it's great for a specific channel, which is, you know, aka a publisher like, uh, but it's, it's less great for a broader set of publishers where you want to reach customers wherever they may be with all of the frequency capping and measurement capabilities that Jason highlighted a, a few minutes ago. Uh, I would say the other uh, thing that we did, um, a few we, uh, Xander announced that they uh, had invested in Infosome. I know LiveRamp is doing some things around this as well. Um, really interesting work being done to help join data sets together in almost an ads data hub-like fashion, even the Google term, uh, but without the need to actually move data around and push data to a common location. I think that when we think about what we were doing at, at Xander, super interesting. How do we start to think about the, you know, an open ecosystem where I can share data, I can measure data between two or three or even four disparate partners and get results back without actually truly having to pass data back and forth or risk um, any kind of privacy or leakage concerns that might uh, arise. And so I think work being done there that I like to think Xander was ahead of the curve on in terms of bringing data to bear for uh, specific brands and, and making that actionable. Well, one other question about kind of, you know, you've got a unique point of view now um, in being able to look at the whole ecosystem freely. And while, you know, you were also there during the acquisition of Warren Media, um, no small little bolt on, um, as uh, they say in the world of M&A. Um, do you see, uh, you know, you see some solutions that are uh, working on being cross-channel from the beginning and then obviously some larger initiatives uh, taking place to make sure that we immediately address moving past the cookie in this so-called digital ecosystem. Do you have perspective or if you were to put on your prognosticator's hat, do you, do you think this is something that needs to be solved first in the so-called digital world that then could be applied 
to television, or is this something that you think we can simultaneously uh, address so that you know we can say, hey, a consumer is a consumer? Um, just knowing the reality of, of uh, mm. somewhat large organizations working with large brands, uh, agencies, and tech partners. Yeah, really interesting question. I, um, you know, I, I won't touch on at t strategy, but what I will say is this, that I, I think it, one, one thing that was highlighted earlier was the, you know, future pressure on things like mobile ad IDs and, you know, it, also other, you know, forms of identifiers, CTV and OTT. But, you know, what's, what's really interesting to me is nobody mentioned IP address. And I think that's actually going to be, and it's a little off topic for you, but also going to be an increasing challenge when you look at CCPA and other regulatory environments. And so what does that mean? If we start to remove the ability to measure people based on IP address or mobile ad ID or, you know, increasing pressure on uh, GPS for location tracking, et cetera, a lot of the things we've talked about that make up the basis of an identity link or other things like that come under increased pressure. And so my answer to your question, Matt, is I think we as an industry need to start to move back, back in mid uh, 2014, 2015 era, there was a term going around the Bay Area called uh, consumer empowered marketing. And I'm a huge believer in that. It's this kind of, you know, we're sort of scratching the surface on it today with uh, people being more and more comfortable with logging into publisher websites and seeing that value exchange. But over time, I think we're going to need to find a way that consumers understand at a very basic and, and easy to, uh, uh, to leverage uh, method that their identity is related to some sort of, uh, you know, on off login capability and that they have control over moving from a television experience to an ott experience to a digital experience and that the only way that this industry is going to succeed outside of the wall gardens which have this in droves already is to create the consortiums and those sorts of things that have been talked about um through uh you know prohaska as well as live ramp and others and i think that's critically critically important so you know look i can't prognosticate what's going to happen in the world of m a i think the uh, coronavirus is going to put a lot of pressure on a lot of companies that already probably had financial pressure uh, before to consolidate and look for ways to partner or frankly, uh, they're, they're going to fail. And so look, some of this is going to be forced. Some of it might be mandated by government uh, uh, interaction. Some of it might be just what's in the best interest of the publisher or excuse me, of the brand. Um, as, my, as my father was always fond of saying, you know, when I bought my first house, and I thought, hey, the seller's going to pay all my closing costs. You know, at the end of the day, there's only one party who brings a check to this transaction, and that's the brand. And so as we think about the whole ecosystem, we have to make sure we're addressing the needs of, of the brand advertiser and making sure that what, what they're trying to achieve is, is achievable. And if we don't, it's going to be all, you know, to the, uh, the, the close gardens or the wall gardens. Great stuff. One last question before, uh, and uh, this was an old uh... – TV reference from primetime. We want to alert our affiliates uh, that we'll be running a few minutes uh, late into uh, late local news here. So uh, appreciate those that are able to stay and hello to those that have had to drop off with hard stops uh, hearing the rest of this great, uh, great content on demand. Um, what's one wish uh, that you'd have, Tim? You can pick either uh, your, uh, your, your former publisher colleagues or your uh, brand partners on the other side. What's, what's one uh, desire uh, that you'd have in terms of either the way they approach uh, building uh, appropriate identity or the way they're uh, partnering with uh, the others on the other side. Where, where were some of the, the hiccups that were frustrating that you, you, you hope uh, would get uh, uh, solved through education and better practices as we go? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, at t is, is in an interesting spot because on the one hand, they could decide to become a wall garden of their own. Uh, and, and on the other hand, um, the acquisitions and strategy that's been laid forth is to create more of a marketplace and create something that's more open and, and, and an alternative to the wall gardens. And I think that if I had one wish, it would be this, that we as an industry started to think along the latter lines, which is how do we really start to interoperate, create an open advertising ecosystem? I know there's a lot of conversation about that. There has been for a decade. The reality is most people are still trying to create their own identity structure or create their own value proposition that it has long-term you know, gain. I can't fault anybody for doing that, but I think if we all continue to look at the TV industry and open AP and everything else that's been tried at, over the last five years, and what you find is a lot of that is still siloed. It's, it's all great in theory, but it still operates very much in a silo. And I would think that you know, if I had one wish, it'd be that we can figure out a 
industry how we're going to really operate in a way that allows the brands to achieve the goals that they want to achieve the consumers to see the transparency and the value exchange of that data but more importantly doesn't uh just empower the wall gardens and, and, and look there's there's a lot of ways we can achieve that uh, but it's going to have to start with people just being much more transparent with how they back and forth and and creating some of these identity strategies that have been discussed today I think you're on mute, Matt. Thank you, Tim. We want to be able to uh, open up some, and take some questions now uh, that have already come in. So uh, first, let's rotate a couple of these around. First for Andrew, and then maybe Jason, if you want to add in. This is from Brian Barnum. Does there need to be a new mechanism in the form of an ID graph or household graph that can connect both first and third party data to specific people, presumably through their devices from CTVs? connected TV uh, to mobile devices, to PC or laptop devices, and what, what might it look like? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, I think that's uh, it's a great thought. And uh, I think the simple answer is there are solutions in market today that, that do that. I think generally speaking, the way to kind of visualize this is like you can imagine your, some of your devices traveling between locations and some of your devices that are stagnant within a location. So you can imagine this spatial map that shows uh, your connected TV staying in your living room, uh, your laptop and uh, mobile phone moving between your living room and your office, uh, and uh, maybe your second laptop uh, also stays somewhere uh, pretty close to, to your living room as well. So all these things can, uh, can represent uh, kind of bespoke devices to, to a single uh, user. Yeah, just Good on deal. Thank you. Um, and yeah, just to piggyback on uh, what Andrew um, uh, eloquent went through, we, we look at it the same way. And as to the point earlier, when we were talking about everything being cross-platform um, with, uh, with ATS um, via identity link, um, it, we absolutely capture uh, the cross-platform um, identity. Uh, so whether you're on a CTV, uh, whether you're on an app, um, or whether you're on a mobile or desktop browser, um, we are able to traverse all of those um, by leveraging our ideals. Um, and again, that's leveraging the trusted relationship that the inline consumer has and will be having more um, with the inline publisher. Um, so we definitely see a world where um, there will be more authentication happening on sites. Um, you know, some good examples that I've had from the past when I was at CBS, um, you know, we were looking at um, you know, widgets that were kind of calendar widgets that um, when, uh, when you wanted to um, be reminded of the AFC championship next weekend, uh, give us your email address and we will put a reminder um, in your calendar. Um, and, you know, it's chock full with great factoids of the, of the game that weekend, but it also gives that one-to-one -one connection so that there's communication leading up to that event. Um, that's just one anecdotal example of myriad that you will start to see as more publishers develop um, an end-to-end -end authentication strategy, as they start to see that true value uh, from the advertisers that are already looking uh, to buy on, um, on identities today. Cool, thank you both. Um, someone wanted to ask about zero-party data. Um, we didn't get into that. We had uh, certainly talked about first, second, and third. Uh, plenty, but uh, does anyone want to take a first shot at uh, uh, addressing where that uh, comes in or to explain that for those who may not know? Mr. Paul Samino first to raise his hand using nonverbal cues and the power of video on Zoom. Paul. Yeah, so um, just to define it, it's, it's if the first party is the publisher of the website, you know, ESPN.com, then the zero party is the, is, the, is the social data that you're emanating, your opinions, ratings, and whatnot um, that are technically owned by the publisher. Uh, it's the most precious kind of data um, from a Prohaska standpoint. The attributes of those most loyal customers are what we're looking to clone up that ID graph and up into the funnel. That's our, you know, that's uh, in a nutshell our basic approach for how to grow the top of the funnel and obviously learn between them. But uh, zero party data is. Um, got to be focused on and, you know, along with first party data and deterministic identity.
Great. Thanks, Paul. Um, one other question uh, that I'll uh, quickly take here. Someone had, uh, Michael had asked about our Global Identity Coalition and the difference between that and IB Digitrust um, that uh, they had seen some starts and stops, uh, Michael had mentioned here in the comments uh, over the past year and a half. Um, one thing that the IB Tech Lab, uh, and for those of you who don't know the history lesson, Jordan Mitchell uh, and Sam uh, and his whole team came to the IB Tech Lab from Digitrust. They were basically acquired or acquired um, with all the great work that they had been uh, working on over the past years as well. Um, they've stated publicly that Digitrust uh, will be will be fading into the background because uh, they learned and a lot of the feedback uh, that we heard and that everyone else supplied to them was that they were looking for the tech lab to do their great standards work that they've done with OpenRTB and vPaid and AdsTXT and their whole rich history there um, and, and not really uh, get involved with owning anything. So they've been very adamant about how they don't own any tech. Very similarly, the Global Identity Coalition is not a tech solution by any means at all. It is meant to be the commercial momentum that is riding side saddle, if you will, with the standards development uh, that the Tech Lab is producing. Um, so with that, um, those uh, qu any other questions that we didn't get to? I know we're already well over time. Um, so I wanted to uh, uh, look to wrap things up here. Feel free, uh, you'll see contact info in the back or just again, ping me personally with anything we didn't address and happy to get that to uh, anyone else uh, here on the panel or our special guest. Yes, Paul? Matt, there was a lot of questions about customer data platform, and I just wanted to give you the opportunity to introduce CDPU or, or something in the future. Yep, for sure. Um, apologies, by the way, to Andrew and Pubmatic. I don't know why that logo didn't build uh, last there. That was supposed to come up at the same time. So uh, sorry for that. Yes, Paul, um, here exactly is the TF uh, where I was just going to mention that. Um, so th those of you uh, customer data platforms or CDP University, here's our upcoming schedule. Uh, we will be continuing uh, next week uh, with Again, the next topic that goes hand in hand with identity, and that is attribution and measurement. Again, one of the other critical uh, issues here. We're thrilled to have Angelina Ng, our friend and newly uh, minted and new leader at the IAB, where she is leading uh, the measurement and attribution practice. Just had her first great committee meeting uh, the other day. Um, so she's off to the races and thrilled to have her with all of her perspective uh, from Merkel um, and other uh, buy and sell side experience over the years. Uh, you'll see then we're going to uh, take a bit of a break and look to come back uh, strong with content marketing on Thursday the 21st. Uh, we will then have our first uh, deep dive session, a half day session. You can see the time there from 11 to 3 Eastern, trying to catch everybody first thing uh, early in the U.S., try not to miss everybody out in London and the rest of uh, Western and Central Europe and EMEA. Um, but we'll go four hours there, and that is a uh, a minimal fee. Uh, look for promotional emails to be coming out and messaging uh, from us in the next uh, week or so uh, around all those highlights. It'll be me and Paul and several other of the Prohaska teammates. Uh, again, uh, we'll have a special fireside chat along with uh, a great uh, a great sponsor that we'll be announcing. Uh, it looks like probably in the next week as well. Uh, and then we'll be uh, tackling programmatic creative, uh, speaking of something that can work much better when you have real identity, knowing how to sequence those ads and be able to handle not just dynamic creative optimization, but also leveraging data uh, from an identity standpoint, deterministically and probabilistically uh, at the OBS and STRATS phase, at the beginning, uh, during the brief, and then during the production process as well. And we'll bring some experience from our brand and agency work there that Nikki Hawk and her team have been doing for quite a while. And then we'll continue uh, in June with, uh, with OTT over the top and CTV Connected TV. Again, uh, we'll look to play around a little bit of the schedule based on demand and where we can bring on partners uh, for great insights uh, with their own services uh, and independent perspective. Um, so with that, uh, on behalf of, there's the bill, on behalf of uh, Paul Semino, Nikki Hawk, Renee Kajowski, Amit Shah, the entire uh, Prohaska family here, uh, a special thanks again to Andrew, Jana, and the entire Pubmatic team, to Jason White at, Pub, at LiveRamp, uh, and to Tim Barth, uh, our friend from AT&T and many other uh, great gigs in the past. Uh, thrilled to have you with us uh, live and throughout this entire session uh, here and on demand. And we'll see you next week. Please continue to stay healthy and safe. Thanks.